Ukraine is not, a, not an easy customer. There are no basic conflicts between Hungary and Ukraine and between the Hungarians and the Ukrainians. Guys, this is the situation that only the politicians are, are guilty for that. <laughs> Most of the investors now, as far as I know, they are not afraid of war. Mm -hmm. They are afraid of different authorities. As long as we don't have answers for those questions, we have to stop this migration. And if you are specially put them to special schools, aha, uh -huh, it's segregation. But if you mix up them, it's assimilation. At least Ukraine is really some kind of democracy. The Foreign Policy Council Ukrainian PRISM is launching a new format. We call it Persona Grata. Within this format we are going to interview the most prominent and distinguished diplomats working and serving in Ukraine. And our first Persona Grata today is the Ambassador of Hungary, His Excellency Istvan Idato. Welcome, Ambassador. my pleasure and thank you for the invitation. And let's start with a few questions about uh, Hungary and Hungarian foreign policy. Are there any eternal interests in the Hungarian uh, foreign policy? Interests which are valid since uh, King Istvan? And are there any new interests that emerge in, in the new age, in the age of new challenges? Sure. Um, let me not go back uh, as far as uh, Istvan the first or, or establishing king who established the Hungarian kingdom uh, but definitely it worth it is worth to go back to the to the 90s where of course um, uh, the Hungarian uh, diplomacy or foreign policy started to be independent uh, some experts say that uh, we had some independence tendencies in the 80s because uh, the, as the Soviet bloc started to, to soften, let's say, um, Hungary was among the first who started to, to widen its relationship and uh, uh, <coughs> establish new contacts, uh, especially with the Western world. But full independence uh, was in the 90s when uh, it was easy to design the foreign policy since uh, the main task was to re-establish or reintegrate ourselves in Europe. And there were two very important European structures which provided possible membership for those new in, newly independent Eastern and Central European countries. This was the um, European Union um, and uh, NATO, both in transition, of course, since uh, they have to adapt, had to adapt to the new situation. But since uh, the establishment of the new integrated Europe was declared by those partners, Therefore, the foreign policy task for the politicians and for those who designed the foreign policy was obvious. Um, but the, the, the second period when there was a huge question mark how to continue was after the achievement of those goals. Because when we became members of the NATO and became members of the EU, um, okay, so we fulfilled the two most important tasks we, we set. Uh, for the future, so how to continue? How um, um, shall be? Shall is it a need for a new and still in independent Hungarian foreign policy when we are in a much uh, prestigious and integrated two structures providing for us uh, new opportunities? And the answer is yes, of course, since uh, all the members of the EU and NATO countries are having their independent foreign policy. They are coordinating it, of course. It is very important that uh, we have an integrated uh, foreign service now in the EU and they are responsible for representing uh, the interests of the 29 countries. But in the same time, and uh, it seems uh, more and more important that, that uh, as a country, if you would like to remain in the international arena, you should uh, really have independent means of your foreign policy activities. Uh, what does it mean in, in the Hungarian case? Uh, after the serious problems caused by the 2008 uh, financial crisis, it was obvious 
that uh, a, a, such an open economy like the Hungarian cannot survive without uh, new uh, dimensions, new kind of relationship with other countries. So uh, it was obvious that uh, the EU and our neighboring country partners remains the most important targets of Hungarian export. But uh, we reached our limits with that. So we had to discover new uh, and important uh, uh, directions of our, our economic activity. And economic activity as such should be very much integrated into the foreign policy. So this uh, classic uh, diplomatic uh, uh, habit or, uh, or activity was not enough anymore. So diplomats should include the economic agenda into their portfolios. And so, thus, um, uh, the, the new era of the foreign ministry um, somehow uh, um, symbolized by, by Mr. Siakto, who really uh, put, uh, put economic issues very much forward. Uh, it was a, uh, not only a kind of revitalization of our classical activities, but also he made it very clear that from the time being and from now on, uh, the ambassadors and any diplomats' uh, activity will be very much merited by the success as economic, uh, uh, how to say, uh, uh, agents in the, in the same time. And it, it's, it was very important because we discovered a lot of new regions in, in the world where we might or might not have uh, had uh, our, our um, relations in the 60s, 70s, uh, mostly because of ideological reasons, so let's to mention such countries like, like black African countries or Indonesia, where, you know, for the hope of turning socialist, those countries was uh, by, by the Soviet Union and by the Soviet bloc was a very active period. But in the same time, it, uh, it was a good foot ground for that, that we established those relations. And now I would like to say that, that Asian countries and African countries are very much included to our priority list. And these are the relations where the first uh, goals are achieved. That's very interesting because to a large scale it coincides with the Ukrainian strategy nowadays. Prioritizing economics and moving into the Asian markets are among the priorities of the current minister. But speaking about the European Union, to what extent it is helpful in promoting Hungarian interests in these new areas? Do you think that uh, foreign policy of the EU reflects Hungarian interest to a, large, to a full scale? Or perhaps there are some issues that need to be fueled by the EU as well? Well, um, you know, the European Union is a very unique uh, institution which is still a little bit under construction. Because, of course, uh, uh, it was obviously a revolutionary thing to, to get rid of those historical adversaries which was characterizing, uh, unfortunately, almost for 250 years, the Euro Western, mostly the Western part of the continent, this famous French-German adversaries, and, uh, which goes at least to, to World Wars and a lot of others. So I think the founding fathers of the EU were wise enough to, to realize that as, uh, as soon as we are not getting rid of those, those things and we are not concentrating on the common values and principles which are really making Europe what is it now, uh, we are just cyclically falling back to the same, same uh, hole. And uh, we are again and again, there will be uh, uh, armed races, um, conflicts, uh, uh, disputes over resources and such things. Uh, of course, when the Eastern and Central European countries joined the EU, most of the principles were set. So that's, that's, that's why, why the adaption period was very important, because we had to, not only economically, but of course in, in a way politically, adapt ourselves to this. And, um, <clears throat> but in, in a certain extent, it helped very much Hungary to, to get rid of or, or get, or close those chapters with its neighbors, which was related to also to, the, to wars in the continent and the minority problems and others. Of course, you cannot say that that's uh, still no little clashes and some disputes between neighbors. It's always happening, so it's, you cannot get rid of it for 100%. But still, um, the, 
the mere fact that we belong to the same um, uh, very important integration institution and we uh, harmonize our activities as to foreign policy is concerned, it is uh, establishing a new kind of uh, uh, faith and, uh, and trust, trust uh, among the partners. Uh, what uh, should the European Union uh, develop more? Uh, it is, I think, for, uh, for, for the globe as such, for the global world, it is still a little bit uh, not clear how the European Union functions. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Because, of course, you have uh, you, you, you had the era of the superpowers, before that you had the era of the great powers, and of course foreign policy and other decisions were made very quickly because the king decided something, or the prime minister, or the government, or the governor, I don't know who, led the country. And uh, since, uh, um, you know, um, mostly time is, is the most important factor in those uh, foreign policy steps, um, I think um, still many capitals consider that the EU's um, greatest weakness is that how all 29 countries can harmonize these steps mm -hmm. and how can they, they, they make common decisions and, and the bureaucracy how they chew it up and, and all those things. Uh, I would like to say that even within the EU there were skepticism that how would it work, but it works. So interestingly in the major issues, in the major questions, there is a harmonized opinion of the EU. And of course now we have uh, specialized diplomats who are uh, representing the EU's opinions here in Kiev, in, in many, many capitals, in, in partner countries. And of course still there are criticism that the EU is too slow, the EU is not clear what they want and these kind of things. I think uh, what the EU tries, tries to represent and how the EU is representing it, uh, it is uh, miraculously well done. Hungary is also part of a number of regional initiatives. Uh, does it help? Uh, I mean, uh, V4, uh, 17 plus 1, three c initiatives. Uh, are they helpful for promoting Hungarian interests and can Hungary play a leading role in these initiatives? And do you need it? In, indeed. Uh, so, uh, there is a, a, a big question mark always that uh, uh, if there is a well-established uh, kind of cooperation, continent-wide cooperation, cooperation by the EU, uh, do you need some regional um, formations, informal or formal uh, formations? Um, somehow, you know, um, after the collapse of the bipolar world and the appearance of, of a new, the possibility of the new Europe, uh, immediately there were institutions which, which tried to help those Central and Eastern European countries to to in, be integrated or to, to at least reach the corridor of, of integration or, or, the, or the entrance of integration. This was the Council of Europe, in a certain extent the, the OSCE and uh, many regional formations. The V4 is started also as a cooperation between those possible, possible candidate countries who can reach um, easily together the, the integration uh, stage um, and uh, of course it was uh, very effective because we could represent our interests together and there was a question mark that sh should we continue after the, the, the goal achieved, the mission being uh, accomplished. Surprisingly the EU always had such regional formations. There was a cooperation between Scandinavian countries, the Benelux countries, southern countries, Mediterranean countries, because there are obviously common interests because of the vicinity of a very special neighborhood like Africa or the Arctic issues and those. And we consider that since we are the eastern borders, let's say, of the EU, with uh, such significant uh, neighbors like Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Russia, of course, and others, uh, we also need a special uh, 
cooperation because somehow this region specific problems should be represented in a better way than for instance the um, Atlantic countries are uh, having knowledge or special attention to this region. So therefore I think uh, the V force uh, task is a, is a double task not only to to facilitate some of the, the integration processes of the Eastern partnership but in the same time as an emerging partners of those traditional or old European countries we also should sometimes lobby that uh, to eliminate those uh, little differences which are characterizing now still, let's say, still the old member states and the, the new member states uh, differences. So, so it, I think, um, the, so the V4 is uh, effective because it's not an established, not an institutionalized uh, something. It is very much based on the common experience, the, the, uh, the natural partnership of those Central European countries. And more and more we believe that Central Europe has a voice, has a, a special identity and uh, of course, thanks God, we gradually are achieving that now Central Europe is one of the engines of, of the development in the European, as to the economic development is concerned. But speaking about these tensions between V4 countries and uh, all Europe or core Europe, uh, we cannot omit uh, the issue of migration. Uh, basically, the position of V4 countries scandalized Brussels and Berlin and these capitals were quite disappointed with the approach of V4 countries towards uh, migration from crisis regions. Can we expect any changes in this regard? Will V4 get more flexible or will it stay tough as it is? Well. Um I think sometimes this migration and the attitude of the V4 countries towards migration is misunderstood. Uh, misunderstood. Um, what the, the main difference is that, that mostly, thanks to many, many factors, these Central European countries never been subject of uh, such migration since they had no colonial past. France, Britain, uh, many of the Portugal, uh, Italy, and others had their colonies. They got used to, to how to say, cohabit with, with uh, different uh, religions, uh, different groups of people, different traditions, and others. And of course, they also tolerated very much that there was an intermixture between those people. And, uh, so uh, they have a knowledge how to handle this. We shouldn't forget when the first wave, a huge wave of migration appeared in, in Hungary, it was a great surprise so, so, and the shock for the society. In 2015, um, when, when thousands of, uh, or, or even ten thousands of, of uh, people just appeared with the desire that they would like to, to, to go to Germany and they, they settled, they were aggressive sometimes, they were demanding they were not very much uh, low obeying and uh, so it was, uh, it, it, moved, it was a multiple task for the Hungarian authorities to handle this, this situation and it generated uh, uh, rather negative reactions from, from the society. Um, the problem is that uh, we, are, uh, we have uh, large foreign communities in probably the largest Chinese community in Central Europe, almost 60,000 people, if I'm not mistaken. We have a large Vietnamese uh, uh, colony also. Uh, they are absolutely adapted to the Hungarian situation. The Hungarian people are really having positive attitudes. Um, we have a lot of foreigners from, from different places. So it was a natural process as they appeared in, in in our countries, the society had time and uh, could get familiar with this, that there are somebody else with different culture, different tradition, different everything. Uh, and so far, so good. So it, it was a very gradual and very healthy process. But if you face 
these societies that a large number of, uh, um, how to say, different uh, people from different background appears with no clear vision how to adapt or integrate them to the society just because it's a burden for somebody else in another country, I think it may, may uh, drive both sides crazy. So somehow those people were not, in their, it was not their intention to come to a, a middle developed uh, Central European country like Poland or Hungary or, or Slovakia. They wanted to go to the rich Germany and they wanted to enjoy the benefits of that. So these people will be not satisfied with the situation and the Hungarian society will be confronted that they are, how to say, how to handle those, those, those people. Uh, this is probably the psychological and moral factor of those, those questions. The other factor is, and this is a big question, that there are uh, already set rules how to handle uh, migrants and how to handle refugees what does it mean in uh, external borders of the EU? So, uh, if the EU is not obeying its own established rules, uh, instead we are in inviting illegal activities like illegal immigration. So, how, how can we um, really say that, that there should be rule of law within the, the framework of the EU? So, uh, because we don't, we say that it, it is uh, the, the, the basic uh, principle of declaring yourself to be a refugee if you could uh, escape from it, the immediate danger and you are settling somehow, temporarily of course, in the first safe country you, you reach, it's mostly the neighboring country of the conflict zone. Uh, but wandering up to Hungary or Germany or France or, or Britain it does not mean to be a refugee, it does mean that you are a migrant and you are illegally made the choice that you want to, to pick a, a country for living and you are just traveling there. Uh, what about then the immigration rules of the EU or, or, or an individual country? So I cannot transfer myself easily to, to live in France or Spain, but I'm an EU citizen. But somebody else who is coming here... So uh, if we confuse and disobey or, or already set rules, how then can we accept anybody to, to obey those rules? So this is the legal part of the... Of the so it is... Uh, so from, from a perspective I understand that the, the quite firm position of the Eastern and Central European EU members are not very much welcome but we are simply putting uh, up those questions which should be answered and we say that as long as we don't have answers for those questions we have to stop this migration. We have to do in the same time or best to find out which are the roots of this migration and provide assistance instead of you know, establishing uh, sometimes not working uh, rules and principles and uh, actions in our own countries, uh, put together this money and and uh, invest to those regions which are uh, uh, generating those waves of migration towards the European Union. So if we identify those problems in, in Northern Africa, in the Arab world and others, and we try the national governments to assist, to prevent, because if these people are leaving those territories, what perspective those territories have. They are losing the, the, the most, uh, uh, how to say, active human material, human beings, which are going with an unpredictable future to Europe, but definitely leaving behind a non-future for those regions which they left behind. So, uh, we think that uh, there should be a widespread discussion taking into this, uh, consideration all the aspects of this migration phenomenon and then we can make the solutions and make the decisions, not before. I see. When you were talking about uh, migrants and uh, communities which need to be integrated and uh, communities which need to be adapted, 
It uh, reminded me of the situation in the United States nowadays with these movements about Black, Black Lives Matter. And that's also the problem rooted back in centuries uh, since the period of slavery and it caused a real outburst and uh, many uh, public protests in the United States. And here in Europe, uh, I believe we also have a vulnerable minority which uh, also needs to be integrated. And uh, that's one of the key problems for, for the Central Europe, uh, I believe, still. It's Roma community. And I, I, I read an article of one of the Hungarian scholars who even mentioned that uh, racism in the United States uh, towards uh, Afro-Americans can be compared to, 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 to the attitude of the Eastern Europeans and Central Europeans towards Roma minority. How would you assess the situation with Roma minority in Hungary? And do you expect or do you believe that it can be somehow uh, weaponized against the government if, if the situation goes in the same direction like it goes in the United States now? Um, I would be very careful to make an, any comparison between the, the Afro-Americans and, and the Roma people. Uh, of course, there are some scholars who probably in the, in, in, in the hope of some American grants or something, they, they try to picture this like that, but I think it's a uh, significant, very significant difference between the two. Uh, probably not, not uh, in, the, in the phenomenon of racism, of course, which is quite a serious problem uh, everywhere, <clears throat> but I think uh, the Roma is a special case. Uh, first of all, in Hungary we have a better situation than in some um, south um, uh, and southeastern, let's say, European countries, because the Roma, uh, the Roma integration started a little bit earlier than, than in those countries. First of all, uh, there is no, th there are no uh, migrant Roma com uh, communities in Hungary since the 19th century, which is not true in, in Bulgaria or in Romania, which I know better. Um, so the Roma population was settled, and there were several attempts to, to integrate them with the same time, of course, with, a, with, with serious ignorance of the, to the situation. The easiest way was not to talk about the problem or uh, solve the problem with, with massive social uh, assistance. They have given money which was not enough to, mm -hmm. to, to, to develop, but, 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 but Probably it was hard enough to survive. That's why we had not Roma and non-Roma communities in the eastern part of the country, which were accustomed to, to live on social uh, uh, benefits. Uh, generations were raised uh, with no knowledge that there, there is a culture of going to work and get employed. So they see that it's easy to live like that. So in, in every month, on a, one Monday, the money comes, and of course it's not enough. So a kind of subculture of not working started to develop, which was good because you know the problem from a political point of view was solved, but unfortunately it generated very, even see more serious problems. So I think nowadays when when the Roma situation is quite somehow managed, I suppose. So this, this Hungarian government made uh, enormous steps to, to uh, face or, or tackle this problem in its complexity. There are two very important uh, things that have been done. First, that without education and proper training uh, of those people, it is impossible because they never will have the chance on it on a significantly changing uh, working uh, labor market. Uh, we don't need any more assistant workers who are I mean, cleaning some machinery and these kind of things. We need uh, sophisticated people. Mm -hmm. The second is that uh, if you don't re-establish the attitude of, uh, of, of a new kind of integration of those people to the society, that first they are important, the second that they need to do something for themselves, uh, all efforts will be absolutely impossible. 
So the two programs, first is the so-called public work system, which you now gives you still the social assistance, but it's very much not in free. You have to go and do something for your community. It generated a new kind of working culture among the Roma people. So it, it, again, it became important to wake up in the morning and go and do something. And there are so much successful programs now which are demonstrating that the, the Roma is no different, which no differs. The Roma people are no different from those who are living in, in their neighborhoods. So they are. Uh, the second is there are more and more work opportunities in Hungary. So this demand for new workforce started to, to, to push in the, the Romans. So the, they realized that it's, it's much better to have a, being employed and getting more salary than wait for the so-called social assistance. And the third factor is, and it was very important that the churches associated themselves to this, that, that uh, we, through these church programs, this never-ending story of the Roma education is now in, in, a, in a good channel. Do you mean Catholic Church? Not only the Greek Catholic Church, the Catholic and the Protestant churches. Uh, why it is important? Because it's again a never-ending problem. And sometimes, you know, the American experience is not necessarily very luckily interfering with this question. Because, you know, in, uh, it was a breakthrough in the southern states of the United States when segregation was abolished and uh, you know the integration of the black uh, population started in various areas including the schooling it was a breakthrough that, that you know the black uh, Americans could go to, to the same schools universities whatever uh, uh, in, in those of those uh, uh, discrimination so in, in the end of discrimination uh, <clears throat> In Hungary, one, one of the most uh, uh, controversial issues, which is often raised by human rights activists, this Roma segregation. But it is a very complex problem, and if we are not approaching it properly, it can easily mislead us. First of all, as I mentioned, you, the, the, the Roma is not a, a, how to say, it's not a, um, it's a different situation. Why it is different? Because, of, of course, if you say that the Roma is a national minority with its language and its tradition, it has a right for their own education. But in the same time, they say that, no, they would like to go to the Hungarian schools. Fine, but then how to maintain their language and maintain their traditions? So, uh, how, what is the proper way to give them education which helps them to be integrated, but in the same time keeps their identity more or less intact. Because they say that there is a, such a Roman, Roman, Roman identity with their traditions, with their dances, with their culture, with their everything. Fine, it's, it's very good. Uh, the problem is then to find the golden uh, middle road that how to provide them the necessary modern knowledge, but in the same time uh, uh, enhance the opportunities to keep their traditions. Simply if we say that you go to the so-called Hungarian school, it's not enough, of course, because you can mix up the people, but this, this is assimilation, and sometimes it's against their will. They say that they don't want to give up their Roma identity. Why they should they? And then, you know, this segregation, non-segregation issue starts. Some activists say that, okay, so, but you, if you are specially put them special schools, Roma schools, Roma classes, aha, uh -huh, it's segregation. But if you mix up them, it's assimilation. So, it's a very controversial, controversial issue, and why the, the churches are very successful, because they don't enter to this. They are, it's not state-provided education, so they are free to establish the so-called Roma schools with special uh, educational systems, and, and uh, they have fantastic achievements because the Roma are very spiritual people. They really believe in, in some kind of superstition, and, and uh, this is very fine. So they are very open for Christianity, and in the same time, 
surprisingly for those blockheads who have stereotypes about the Roma, they are really uh, open for new uh, knowledge. And, and there are so many success stories, Roma, how Roma people can easily uh, have any kind of uh, progress if they are, uh, this road is provided for them. But certainly I think the key is properly understand the complexity of the Roma, Roma problem, if there is a problem, so the, the Roma issue, integrate them to the solution somehow, and, and regardless to some kind of sometimes not very positive attitudes or uh, the disputes and, and people who know better and would like to interfere into the situation, um, concentrate on the results, because otherwise it will be only uh, situation. But answering directly, your, I don't see uh, some kind of so there are tensions in the Hungarian society. I don't want to deny it. Uh, I don't think so that the Romani people, the Roma people, are in a stage of street demonstrations or or especially uh, anti-government activities or these kind of things. We have local problems. We have local clashes some mismanagement of issues, but uh, also it gives out us uh, plus energy to resolve the problems. And I think for a long run, um, the integration of Roma, is, it's not only not impossible, but it's absolutely uh, uh, proper policy. Thank you for this very comprehensive input. Now let's jump to your competence and to your job description to bilateral relations between Hungary and Ukraine. According to our annual assessment, uh, which we call scorecards of foreign policy of Ukraine, scores for Hungarian dimension of our foreign policy is low. At least it was low in 2019, because we do not have results for this year and certainly there are some improvements. The score was C-. minus. If you were to assess Hungarian foreign policy towards Ukraine, how would you assess it? I mean, uh, when we do our assessment, we consider a few factors. It's political interest towards the relations with the country, it's institutional cooperation, I mean inter-institutional between MFA, Ministry of Economics, other agencies, it's uh, strategic vision and it's activities. So how would you assess this factors in our bilateral relations, speaking about Hungarian foreign policy towards Ukraine. I see. Uh, of course, I don't have the infrastructure and the proper, how to say, methodology to make my own assessments as precisely as you can do. Uh, but I don't want to deny that the Hungarian foreign policy was also not very active towards Ukraine, um, at least last maybe 10 years. Somehow it is uh, an interesting. So Ukraine is not a, not an easy customer for for uh, if you are not in the size of a, at least um, mid power. Um, uh, if I can be frank, uh, it should, which is which is uh, not a diplomatic virtue, uh, but uh, but frankly, uh, I am observing as an outsider for a long time. Ukraine, I think Ukraine had real problems to identify its position in the, in the world and in Europe. Uh, I remember the, when, the, when the Ukrainian independence started, the, the, the say was that we are like France, uh, because we are in the size of France, the population is almost the French, and um, so that's why we have to position ourselves uh, in, in, the, in the post of France. Uh, which is fine, uh, self-identification is absolutely important, but in the same time it, it is decimating your partners, because if you are not in the same league, it's like in the, in the, in the Navy, so there are the, the dreadnoughts, there are the cruisers, there are the, um, how to say, the torpedo uh, uh, destroyers, and there are the, the, the others. And even in the fleet, they said that uh, it is not very fair to, to have a, a sea battle 
among not the same league partners. So when, if you lost the battle, so we were not in the same league. That's so, about a battle, about <laughs> cooperation. <laughs> yes, but, but diplomacy is a certain, as we know from, from the classics, it's a certain continuation of wars, but, which I don't believe uh, in the, but, but so, so they say. Um, actually, uh, and of course, since Ukraine uh, really uh, had this endeavor to position a little bit uh, for, for, for different league, I think sometimes uh, you really legitimately have the impression that it's uh, not very much concentrating on those na even neighboring countries which are not in an in a immediate uh, interest of, of Ukraine. So it was much more easy and we understand that the geopolitical situation around and in Ukraine determined somehow Ukraine's uh, pick of partners and uh, of course the guarantors and guarantees and these kind of things. So. Um, I think, and, and it, it, it is uh, sometimes happening that if there are no immediate uh, uh, businesses between the, the leaders and, uh, and the political class of the country or, or this kind of thing, so somehow the, the, the relations are not, not um, uh, dead, but, but they are deteriorating significantly. You know? And, and I think it was the, the problem between Hungary and, uh, and Ukraine that Ukraine has had its interest and they were investing a lot of energy to, to fulfill them. And Hungary had all others. And, and that, that's why somehow it was, uh, since you, there were no problems, there were no uh, immediate needs for somehow getting involved, um, I would say that Hungary is okay, Ukraine is okay, we are. We are fine, so there is no uh, necessary city to invest to the, to the bilateral relations. And unfortunately, I think after 2014, it, it paid off in a negative way. So we had, we we, we were absolutely uh, not very careful not to lead, let this institutionalized. Uh, important elements of bilateral relations to deteriorate and uh, then when the problem started we had uh, even not the memory that how to tackle them because we just forget that these institutions are there and they should be uh, entered to the, mm -hmm. to, the, to the problem resolving system. So uh, I think uh, it, it, is, it is the first and very important factor that there were no intense bilateral political relations which could easily, um, how to say, uh, help to, to, to plug in a little bit the tensions. So more or less we can talk about reciprocity in bad approaches, in your own approaches. It would have been not a problem if there is no uh, turning point. <laughs> so now we switch to the sensitive area of cooperation and obstacles to cooperation. We, we had uh, the important visits of, of the ministers just recently and mm -hmm. uh, we, we can observe uh, economization of the relations and, mm -hmm. and as far as I'm concerned there is bilateral interest in, in some joint initiatives. So what are the most promising economic projects that can be implemented in, in, in the coming years? investment projects, whatever, and what are the key obstacles? And I mean, if talking about minority issue, can it be an obstacle to economic cooperation? Well, uh, I, I was talking about the political side of the story, but the economic side basically never been harmed uh, before or after the conflict. So, because the Ukrainian economy and the Hungarian economy could find the ways to each other. So we had several serious businesses and uh, you know investments also to, to Ukraine. Ukraine remained and still, uh, regardless of the conflict, of course, well, since Hungary and Ukraine was also hit by, by the 2008 conflict. But before that, and even after the recovery, um, our business people could find each other easily. So there was no problem in that 
area. Uh, basically, the political side only had one obligation to, to pave the way more for more intense uh, business uh, opportunities and business issues. Um, and of course, uh, the projects what we have and which were a little bit blocked by these political tensions are to this character. So opening more border crossing points, modernizing that region which is uh, in the you know, common interest in a certain way because this is the, 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 the territory where the two countries meet. This is Akarpatya. Uh, having uh, better connections as to railroads, as to uh, motorway roads are concerned. So this, these are the projects which should be continued and, and it was, uh, if I can use this uh, word, it was a crime not to, to, to make it uh, happening. Uh, so therefore I think uh, there are so many areas where it's easy to restart or even which were never broke uh, in, in those political disputes areas uh, or periods. Um, there are more, even there are more and more Hungarian, uh, since there is a government program now to, to encourage the Hungarian business to go abroad mm -hmm. and start to invest, especially in neighboring countries. First of all, I, I think, unfortunately, I have to associate myself to those, mostly Western business people and diplomats, who are saying that, that the, uh, the investment intensity towards Ukraine is very much depending on the Lego and other climate uh, of the country. Uh, if it's not changing significantly, rapidly, there is no stability on the business uh, climate in Ukraine. Unfortunately, only the or a very especially huge and very especially uh, bulletproof businesses can come and can survive in Ukraine, which is not necessarily the Hungarian, com Hungarian companies. Uh, now, Hungarian companies can take no more and more risk, but some, sometimes the Ukrainian market is too risky for them, for it, as to their capital and as the size is concerned. So if this climate will change in the, in the foreseeable future, I think spontaneously Another question is, if the climate changes but the war with Russia remains, will it be frightening for the investors? The war? Yeah. Most of the investors now, as far as I know, they are not afraid of war. They are afraid of different authorities, yes. different concurrency, which is exploiting their, their vulnerability. Um, the, sometimes the legal procedures, which are not, they are considered not to be very much fair, the controversy of, of the legal system. So all those which is not related somehow to war. Yes. So the war, war is war, of course, it's not um, in, 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 an, in an overall rating of a country, it's not helpful. But we know where better we are living here, the time uh -huh. how, how it's happening. And uh, there is no war in Binitsa or no war in, in Sumi or no war in, in, in Lviv. Uh, but still, sometimes you feel that there is, but not <laughs> by the aggressor, but by somebody else who is raiding you and, mm -hmm. and making your life miserable. I see. Speaking about the efforts of civil society that can be done by for improving the relations, last year you participated in uh, Ukraine-Hungary civil society forum co-organized by Ukrainian prism. How would you assess this effort? Should we continue? What can be the changes of format? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it was uh, of paramount importance because the and uh, I I really thankful for prism to start this uh, uh, project because it was since okay it was maybe you can say that they, they were baby steps of uh, some kind. But first of all, um, it was based on the discovery that uh, 
not only the maybe the political uh, level was ignorant to each other somehow in a certain extent, but that uh, that in the in the very important area of those people who are thinking about uh, politics and thinking about foreign policy and thinking about many issues, uh, they were not necessarily uh, in a better knowledge of each other. So. Uh, and unfortunately, I think the Hungarian side is as, um, um, how to say, um, as, as uh, um, what is the proper English word I try to say, as we know what, but uh, um, uh, so it has, has the responsibility for it. And guilt. As, as guilty for that, thank you. Guilty for that as, as the Ukrainian side, because if I take into the consideration how many people really uh, can declare that it's an expert of Ukraine in Hungary, well, it's quite a sad number. So, and vice versa, so they don't, here, right? don't consider so much Ukrainians who are declaring themselves that I'm an expert of Hungary. And it's a shame. It means that somehow on the level of uh, NGOs, on the level of, of the academy, uh, academic life, we have no proper exchanges, we have no context, we have no uh, vivid life uh, which easily can help those people to, to exchange information, to, to fight stereotypes, to have better knowledge, have, have updates on issues. So these, these channels, these uh, very important channels are not working or, or missing. And I think this PRISM initiative started... So if you at least identify these missing uh, elements, the, mis the, the missing of networking, a lot of things, uh, you have been achieved uh, enormous uh, results. Uh, because my impression was that uh, during and after the meetings, those experts who were there, they couldn't really identify serious conflicts or problems. So we came back to, the, to, to, to my uh, already one million times repeated issue that there are no basic conflicts between Hungary and Ukraine and between the Hungarians and the Ukrainians. To the contrary, there is a natural uh, good face to each other. But time to time we have issues we are, we are not tackling very successfully and this may, might lead to, to political disputes and this kind of things. But overall there is a very positive sentiment between the two nations and the two countries and we simply do not exploit it properly for our benefits. And I think if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, probably I'm too optimistic, uh, Prism with this round table has made a very important step to put a mirror to those nice Hungarian Ukrainian experts, and guys, this is the situation, but only the politicians are, are guilty for that, so, or, or what? And, and, and I think it was, uh, it was a success. Thanks a lot for this high assessment. Yeah. And now let's move from, from sensitive and uh, sometimes painful issues to some entertainment issues. I, I, I know that uh, Ukraine has changed a lot in this decade since independence. But uh, for you as a diplomat, is there any difference between your first visit as in the capacity of a diplomat and uh, your stay now as an ambassador here? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what are the key differences? Enormous. I visited Ukraine as an official in 1990. So can you imagine? So it was really uh, the first millimeters of independence of Ukraine, let's say. And I think since Ukraine, uh, probably it's from outside, it's easy to assess those who are living uh, among these conditions for the last 30, 35 years. They might not. Uh, uh, I think Ukraine had a very interesting road to, to go, which was Bumpy, which was really uh, very much uh, problematic, but at the same time uh, really had had, had uh, fulfilled a lot of things. So it's 
So uh, it's very hard to find. I'm not a sociologist. So I cannot, cannot tell you proper categories where, in my mind, uh, Ukraine falls. But but at, at least Ukraine is really some kind of democracy with all these uh, children sicknesses mm -hmm. and, and problems and whatever. But uh, the, the country is very vital in, in things. I enjoy very much that there are so many different uh, uh, cultures and, and, uh, and uh, regions and so on, so, 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 so. So in this variety, so, so there are so many uh, factors which are saying that Ukraine should not be a country, but still is. I think it is very important uh, uh, that this, the diversity uh, uh, is not working against Ukraine, it's working for Ukraine. But I think that this diversity should be kept, otherwise this whole thing probably will not be as such as, as from the time being. What are your favorite regions in Ukraine except for Transcarpathia and Kyiv, which is obvious? Well, I, I haven't been in so many areas, but I would like to say that that uh, um, not necessarily a Ukrainian patriot will agree with me, but but I like that that, and unfortunately, sometimes it was tragic for Ukraine, but this very uh, difficult past had its significance in many. So if you travel in Ukraine, you can really relive history because you can find the Cossack past, you can find the Polish past, you can find the Russian Empire past, even some Austro-Hungarian monarchy past. It all had its impact, but in the same time, it is very unique that the Ukrainian nation could survive. And uh, with, of course, with some unavoidable changing. And if your friend from Calgary comes, what do you recommend him or her to do or to see first? First of all, you know, you cannot avoid Kiev because it's a very unique city. So uh, I think Kiev is a, it's not an attraction. But, but uh, I, I definitely not necessarily recommend, I'm so sorry for that Chernobyl because I think it's uh, unfortunately um, this catastrophic tourism is becoming uh, this crazy habit of the human beings nowadays, and we have enough catastrophes, so we shouldn't make it touristic attractions, so, uh, in my very conservative approach. Um, definitely I would recommend to visit uh, many places, uh, especially you know, traditional Ukrainian uh, cities like uh, Chernigov or, or Vinitsa is a very nice place. Uh, of course, Odessa is absolutely unique, and, and the Black Sea side. Uh, Lviv is getting more and more attractive for Hungarians uh, since, you know, it's uh, the capital of Kalichinya, and uh, so many Hungarians were there spending their military times in the past, and, uh, and these kind of things. So Ukraine is much, much more attractive than sometimes the Ukrainians believe. And in the same time, I would like to report to you with all, at utmost happiness that, that you, Hungary is becoming more and more important. So before the COVID and this whole crazy thing, um, the last year we witnessed 48% growth of the, uh, of the stream of Ukrainian tourists to Hungary. Who are not, uh, it's not tra uh, transit tourists, mm -hmm. but, but where the destination was, was Hungary. And I think it is a very good indicator again that on the people to people level, we, we do not have a problem, we never had a problem between Ukraine and Hungary. Let's hope for spillover effort. Okay. And is there anything else you wanted to say, summarizing any like very final message? Well, I'm not believing in necessary messages, but first of all, I would like to thank you for the opportunity for that, because I think uh, uh, if there is a reason why we should be active in Ukraine to 
overcome all the, those differences that we have uh, so far, and of course boost these um, civil relations which we were identifying that unfortunately was missing in the past uh, couple of years. So therefore I think that uh, I try to encourage uh, more and more Hungarian academic and other people to establish and, uh, and maintain Ukrainian context as far uh, as I'm concerned, but I also would like to ask it to, to be kind of engines of, of establishing more and more Ukrainian-Hungarian context, because it is necessary, it is missing so far, and, and I think it m might generate a network when we are, hopefully not, but when if there is a, again, a falling uh, period of, of our bilateral relations, this network can just easily keep it in a certain level. And it, it, we are not go very trend, unfortunately, around 2017-18. Uh, Thank you. We'll do our best. And many thanks for being our personal grata today. It's my personal.